Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a great show for you today. We are going to talk all about mulch. This is a barn burner, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be the most exciting topic since you talked about grass. Um, this is going to be a fun show, though. And you know, I'm not going to do this all by myself. I'm joined, as always, every single week by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. I like mulch more than I like dirt grass. So I, I agree. For what it's worth. Yes. yes. Um, as, and this is going to be a, 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 an entire episode about mulch. And so hold on to your hats. We're, uh, we're still just scratching the surface. I know we are. Um, and I, I, I just, I don't know what to think of this right now. If I look back at my younger self and I said to my younger self, Hey, you know, when you're a grown up, you're going to, you're going to be like a, a quasi expert in mulch. My younger self would probably punch me in the face. So, uh, <laughs> my so self anyway, would say what's mulch. Yeah, exactly. Like who, who are you? Am I really going to grow up into this person? Yeah. So I wouldn't recognize myself. I was in a, I was in a punk rock band in high school. So this, now I'm talking about mulch. So this is going to be fun. Um, and we, of course, to join in on on all the fun and festivities, we have a special guest today, horticulture educator Emily Zweihart from the Quad Cities. Emily, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Good to be back. Well, we are happy to have you here to talk about everyone's favorite topic of mulch. Um, I, maybe I'm just having a midlife crisis here, so I apologize. But we're <laughs> we'll get through this together. That that we're all experts in mulch because we all actually spent a day and a half learning about mulch it was a great day i don't know what you two are talking about like i think our younger selves would be so dang proud of us and our knowledge of mulch maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe they would be maybe be like so they actually pay you to do that like yeah they do like okay so maybe they would be proud thank you for shining that light on us emily um because I, I, I mean, mulch is important, and that's why we're talking about it today. Mulch, mulch. We're gonna say that word a lot. Yes, yes. All right. Well, Ken, if you wouldn't mind just get this kicked off on the topic of mulch uh, this week with the first question about mulch, please. All right. Our first mulch question this week is: What is mulch, and what is it good for? <laughs> Ken, what a good question. <laughs> okay, so I'll start with the most basic definition of mulch being that it is a material laid on top of the soil rather than being worked into the soil um, or other, it, it can be any sort of material. There's wood mulch, of course, and that I think um, we'll talk quite a bit about. It's very popular, very available. Um, other mulches would include things like stone, um, cardboard, straw. Uh, leaf matter, um, all sorts of different materials just on top, laid on top of the soil. Uh, you ask, what is it good for? A lot. It's good for a lot. And before we get into that, um, I think I've warned you guys before that I like to consider the origin of the plants and the things that we're talking about when it comes to the natural world, because these are not new uh, phenomenons for the most part, and neither is mulch. Most of the woody plants in our landscape, most of the um, perennial plants in our landscape evolved in situations or in um, ecosystems that had a natural mulching system uh, built into it. So let's think of like a woodland setting. Nobody was going through and raking up leaves and removing them from the site um, every fall, you know, leaf debris, uh, wood uh, materials that would, you know, drop from the under canopy um, or things that had died under um on the forest floor would just lay there and decompose while they were decomposing they were suppressing um you know some growth from other plants they were helping to preserve some moisture in the soil um, helping to protect soil from erosion um, and so the mulch that we're putting on our landscape is doing kind of the same thing we're trying to mimic um, some of those those conditions in our own landscape with um, the material that we're putting on top of the soil and so we we have a wide diversity of mulches, as, as you mentioned, Emily. And so I'm curious, uh, we'll, we'll get into all the different types, but do you have a favorite that you typically would utilize in your home landscape? 
Well, yes, I pretty much only use a um, like a wood mulch, a chipped kind of chipped wood mulch material for a couple of reasons. Um, probably ec um, economics <laughs> is the first mm -hmm. one. <laughs> it's very available. Um, it's locally sourced. Um, I can get it from one of the local city compost facilities for a really good price and it can go a really long ways. Um, but I do that also because like a natural wood, um, if it's it's material that has been like harvested from a tree that's either been removed or limbs that have been pruned off, a lot of times it's more than just a singular material in that mulch. So you have um, components of heartwood, so that hardwood material that's going to take a long time to decompose um, and is full of lignin and it just like kind of sits on your landscape for a longer period of time. Then you've got bark material, which is a little more porous. It can help with water retention. Um, then there's also like leaf matter in there that's going to decompose much more quickly and um, release nutrients and make those available to the plants that I am mulching. And so um, personally, I just always use kind of a wood chip, wood mulch um, compound um, type of material. Do you guys use anything or have a favorite? Yeah, I use the wood chips as well. Um, last couple of years, we're using more and more beef, <clears throat> shredded leaves and stuff. So in the fall, when everybody breaks up their leaves into bags and puts them on the curb, we drive around town and build a van up, make several <laughs> several runs, and but they basically just store them in the backyard. We we got chipper shredders, we shred them and either put them out or store them in bags in the garage. And last year we didn't get to shred all of them before it started raining, got cold, and everything. So we probably had thirty bags of leaves that sat outside during the winter and could kind of shred this spring. Um, some of them water got into the bags and it was nice and anaerobic in there. Um, but it so smells those, great. <laughs> those those just got used as as is. The problem I don't like like non shred leaves because they they mat real easily. Um, and that kind of sheds water and stuff. But it was good for areas we wanted to kill off. So yeah, we're I like I like wood chips. We're doing more leaves just because it's easier to get a hold of uh, in the fall. Yeah, I I utilize both of those. I. I like using the, um, the arborist wood chips. As you said, Emily, those leaves that get mix mixed in sometimes when like a tree care company is cutting down maybe a live tree. Um, some people don't like that. I do. I'm like, it's free nitrogen. I will take it. And so I, I, I really do enjoy utilizing the arborist wood chips. Some, a lot of times, if you can get a hold of a tree care company while they're working in your neighborhood, they'll dump them in your driveway for free. So, um, uh, uh, that that's what I like about the arborist wood chips. Shredded leaves, I utilize those a lot, especially at the, the kind of the back portion of my yard. Um, a lot of times we'll pull the leaves or blow or rake the leaves off the lawn area there. And we have a little woodland garden and we will shred or kind of leave some of the whole leaves set there. Um, and then by the time, well, next fall comes around, most of them have decomposed and ready for more leaves. And I, I recall when I interned at Missouri Botanical Garden, the mulch they used was called leaf mold, which is essentially just shredded leaves. I think they even tumbled them and like a, they had like a dye so that it was a kind of all of a consistent dark color. Um, but that was amazing mulch and it's not heavy. <laughs> you can carry like, you know, a bushel with one hand. It's is uh, I love shredded leaves because of the lightweightness of it. Um, and as Ken said, shredding them is useful. I, I find shredding them helps also keeps them seated on the landscape. You would think that the smaller particle size, they blow around a little bit more. But I think with the smaller surface area, they don't catch the wind as easy and they don't blow around as far. So, well, that is a lot of interesting information about those types of mulches, but we have a lot of other mulches to discuss and maybe some of those uh, maybe cons of some of these mulches. So Emily, when it comes to the, the, the wood chips, have, are there any uh, negatives that come into play when using something like a, a wood mulch? There can be some, well, like with anything, right? There are some pros and cons. So with wood mulch um, or wood chips, one of the things to consider is that decomposition process. A lot of people get concerned about um, the tying up of nitrogen as um, it breaks down over time. The research has shown that that can happen, but it's usually just at the um, intersection of the soil and the mulch level. 
So um, just by the process of decomposition, um, those, those microbes tie up nitrogen um, and utilize it. So it's not available to plants. Um, I don't get worked up over it and I don't, you know, obviously I don't stop using wood mulch um, because it is eventually available to plants. And also I hope my plants are not growing. Um, they don't have roots in that intersection of soil and mulch. I hope that they have roots deeper into the soil level. And um, so that would be where I would need those nutrients to be available. So that's one concern some folks do have um, when it comes to using wood mulch. Another, I guess, potential concern for wood mulch, if you're getting the bagged stuff, sometimes you don't necessarily know where that's coming from. Uh, some places will use like uh, shipping pallets, they'll shred those and and put that in the mulch and dye them and stuff, which, you know, you don't necessarily know what's been on those pallets. I, I would hope it's not anything too toxic, um, but you, you never know. And and some of them, like the pine nugget, um, like bark, that stuff will kind of repel water and doesn't really break down much or all that quickly. So you kind of lose some of those benefits of the, the decomposition. I've used some of that stuff in the past, and, you know, after three, four years, it's still kind of look the same as when I put it down, whereas your, your typical wood mulch, like your arborist wood chips are going to break down and you're going to have to replenish that every few years because they are being broken down and returning those nutrients to the soil. You said about pine mulch too. You, um, repeated use of pine mulch can eventually uh, create a more acidic um, soil uh, profile, which is great if you're growing things that desire to have a, a lower pH in the soil. So like blueberries, um, a lot of people will try to mulch with pine needles around them. Um, that takes a while to, to achieve that, that pH change, but um, it can happen. Um, you know, if that's the resource that people have available to them, say like a windbreak, they're harvesting you know, pine needles from a windbreak or, or getting um, bagged pine needles, um, that can happen over time. Now, the interesting thing from our our time spent at the mulch seminar uh, was kind of in all of the research, they seem to conclude that the most effective mulch is thick. So like a thick layer in terms of weed suppression and a coarseness and texture, like a chunky type mulch. And so a lot, I, I think what comes into play here is a lot of, we have like a thick layer that's able to suppress the weeds. The coarseness allows water and air to move and exchange with the soil, which is what our plant roots need. And, and I think that's probably why arborist wood chips seem to fit that bill, just because wood chippers are not really designed to create a mulch for a landscape, as we would often think, that's uniform. Um, and wood chippers are also very by just quality. Um, we've gotten arborist wood chips that are absolutely beautiful. And then we've gotten the same wood chips that looks like, um, uh, looks like someone just went after with a machete or something. It looked awful. My wife said, you're never getting that again. I'm like it does the same thing. It's all variable shapes and sizes and allows good water and air exchange into the soil and keeps the weeds down. Um, just put them in the backyard if you don't like the look of them. We've had something similar happen too, where you'd actually get some pieces of like twig. They would be, you know, 12 inch pieces or whatnot. So there is some variability and that's important to keep in mind. Um, we used it. It was fine. Still served its purpose because that was not the entire batch of mulch. You know, there was a, a wide range of different soil or different um, textures and uh, particle sizes, but yeah, looks, looks matter too when it comes to mulch. If we end up with bigger pieces, I just pull them out and yeah. use them for firewood. Perfect. Yeah, I use mine to help me uh, do barbecue grilling and getting coals moved around and stuff. So they they serve a purpose. Yes. And Ken, you had mentioned like the pine um, nugget or like that bark mulch because bark has a, is a waxy coating substance to repel water. Um, they're hydrophobic. There's other materials. So like cypress um, mulch, um, same thing. They have kind of they're kind of have a hydrophobic or kind of water repelling nature to their cells especially when they're shredded and those shredded fibers, they knit together and they actually form a shell. And I don't know, I like this summer, I, I really noticed that. So I, I actually had some shredded mulch in the yard and I noticed the difference between that and the arborist wood chips with the shredded mulch, they knit together and form the shell. I, I watered um, uh, some of my plants and the water just runs off. I go to the arborist wood chips, I water and it soaks in and 
definitely saw that difference this year. Both mulches were put down last year. And so they've both been around at about the same period of time. Um, but if you do have shredded mulch, you can fix that by just cultivating that with like a like a rake or a three prong cultivator to break that shell up once or twice a year. Well, what about rubber mulch? Has have either of you had fun with rubber mulch before? Because I have, and um, it's it's not all that I think that it's it's uh, uh, kind of chalked up to being. I've only had experience with rubber mulch on the playground when I was a kid. I luckily have avoided um, using rubber mulch in, or encountering it in any sort of pro uh, professional capacity. Yeah, I've only, playground is the only time I've ever seen it or not even used it, but yeah. Well, I, I remember at horticulture when we were in school down in Carbondale, uh, some person came to the school and said, hey, we're going to give you this amazing mulch, it's rubber, uh, it never goes away, uh, it keeps the weeds down, and we're going to dye at your school colors. And so, of course, you're like, well, heck, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. They gave a really good deal. It was cheaper than regular mulch. Well, so it was basically shredded tires. And in a lot of these cases, these are uh, organizations that have a bunch of tires that instead of paying a landfill fee to, to put them where they're supposed to go, they shred them up and they try to sell them to other folks for, you know, a small amount of money. Um, and I think it was Linda Chalker Scott, who we were taught listening to for the seminar. And she said, uh, you know, if the EPA says that a tire outside of a landfill is considered hazardous waste, how does that change it when it's shredded up and put around our roses? And so um, that was very interesting. But in the case of my school, it's not permanent. Rubber actually does decompose. It does degrade over time. And also our school colors faded and left behind just what looked like shredded tires. And they put them in the parking lot beds. And in the summer in Southern Illinois, it gets really hot. It just smells like hot tires. Um, so it was gross. And, and so rubber mulch is not all as chalked up to be. I think um, there are lots of components that go into making tires that stuff has to break down and go back into the environment and what is the result of that i don't think we have enough research to really say um but there are various you know plasticizers and accelerants all those things that go into making tires and is that good for our soil or not well it's a petroleum product too a petroleum based mm -hmm. product and so you got to think about what you anything that's decomposing on the soil surface is going to be then making its way into the soil and being available to plants. And so what are those plants? How are they using them? How is it going to serve our landscape needs and, or not, or not serve them? Go with a not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess that then maybe brings us to our next one, which I, uh, I, I did landscaping for a little while. I pushed a lot of wheelbarrows of this stuff, rock mulch. Everybody loves rock mulch. It's heavy. Um, that's all I'll say about that. And I, I, uh, I don't think I'll ever put that in my yard. Um, but, but we'll see. I'm, I'm still learning about, you know, the ways of mulch, I guess, but uh, the, I don't know, Ken, Emily, how do you feel about rocks as mulch? Not a fan. So oh, and, no. and man, our the house we bought, they had some pea gravel in areas. And that stuff's easy enough to move with a shovel. And we just put that around the near the foundation of the house because it's fairly easy to maintain. Uh, but the house my parents moved, they got lava rock everywhere. And I hate that stuff. Because <laughs> you cannot shovel that, you know, pick it out by hand. And we're doing theirs at level of lava rock and then landscape fabric. And another layer of lava rock underneath that and plastic under that. So needless to say, those beds did not get cleaned up because it is an absolute pain to deal with. Yeah, I think that layering of um, landscape fabric or most oftentimes um, a plastic material underneath the stone, the theory goes that it is going to keep the rocks from um, 
like sinking into the soil profile, right? It's going to keep a barrier between your mulch and your soil, and it's going to keep it clean. It's going to suppress weeds underneath. Like this is, um, I think the traditional thinking for um, applying a, a sort of fabric or um, barrier material underneath the stone. Um, beyond, besides being um, heavy, hard to get rid of if you ever do want to commit to it um, or, or I guess uncommit to it, or if you've inherited it from, you know, a land purchase. Um, it doesn't actually work. So with, with uh, you know, having a fabric underneath your stone, over time, you're still going to build up um, composted materials. Like you're still going to have leaves fall onto that, that bed. Um, you're still going to have the breakdown of those materials. And so you'll have this organic matter that's just living within and filling in those um, those spaces of your rock mulch, there's going to be weeds in there. So if you're using mulch primarily to suppress weeds, that's not going to long-term be a solution for you. You can't really like reapply, or I guess you could reapply. It would just be like another layer of um, fabric with more um, stone on top of it. And it just kind of like perpetuates this, this challenge. Um, it's also not going to be permeable to water or air. So the soil underneath is going to be um, sacrificed in a major way. And so this, it goes, I, I guess we can get into the whole topic of um, using a, a barrier between any sort of mulch material and uh, your soil, but um, it just doesn't, it doesn't pan out. The theory doesn't play out in the landscape. And so I guess it's a long winded way of saying, I'm not a fan, <laughs> not a fan of rock mulch. And with rocks, I'm, I'm sure they've done studies and I just haven't looked at them, but I feel like, you know, if you're doing it around plants, those plants, that, those rocks are going to retain heat. It's going to be hotter and it's going to be hotter into the night too. And a lot of plants, you know, you need that, that cooling off uh, in the evening too. So I think that's another, in my opinion, another strike against rocks. Maybe not lava rock, maybe that doesn't get quite as hot, but some of your larger, more solid type stones. There is, I mean, we just spent a few minutes kind of nagging on um, rock mulch. There, there have been some studies though that it does help with um, the temperature moderation of the soil. Like it does shade the soil. And so um, if you don't have that fabric in there, you know, above the rocks, yeah, that reflective heat can be um, detrimental to plant health. But below there is still some um, benefits of having a mulch, even if it's rock mulch versus not having anything. Um, to me, looking at the evidence, it's not worth it still. there's a, To me, there's better options for mulch on the landscape besides rock. But. I think from a horticultural standpoint, whatever mulch we choose, we want it to contribute back into the system and rock doesn't. Uh, or it, it, it does so very slowly over the course of multiple generations of humans. So um, yeah, in, in the time scale that we will be gardening yeah, rock doesn't doesn't do it for us. So I, that's that's kind of why I kind of turn my cold shoulder to rock. And I know Ken, why you don't like lava rock? It's because actually University of Nebraska at Lincoln has shown that lava rock deters snakes. And you like your snakes, don't you? Snakes are cool. Snakes are cool. It's hard on their little bellies. It is. It is. Well, I I think. There's one more mulch I'm going to throw out there, and it's one that I have been seeing more and more and has been driving me crazy. AstroTurf. Have you guys seen the trend of putting, ripping out your lawn, ripping out your landscape beds and just putting AstroTurf down? We're not talking about a desert. We're talking about Midwest. Like, it's not, crazy. I think. Not lawn. I mean, athletic fields, man, not lawns. I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. Check out I the haven't... YouTubes. <laughs> I haven't seen it either. I was going to say, I've seen it on a, an increase on, you know, sports fields, but. Mm -hmm. Well, Aaron Rodgers aside, we could probably get into that right now, but um, putting a fake or a, it's kind of like rubber mulch, a, a, a poly based or plastic based material over top of the soil, a, an AstroTurf lawn is not a no maintenance lawn. It has to be cleaned. It has to be vacuumed. Um, and they have a lifespan. Like they all will eventually begin to degrade and fade and, and not look very good. So all of that has to get ripped up and sent to the landfill. 
And now you're left with a soil that for the last like seven to 10 years has not had any inputs on it. And I, I, um, just, just my word to say, not a fan of AstroTurf, uh, being used more and more to cover our soils. And that stuff gets hot too, mm -hmm. uncomfortably hot. Yeah. Yes. It can burn people. <laughs> and pets. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we have a series of quick questions here. We'll promise we'll be as fast as we can. Um, and I'll, we'll just lightning fire here. These off, uh, to, I'll, uh, to Emily. So I'll, I'll start here. Emily, tell us about allelopathy. Uh, is that a problem with mulch? I'm glad you asked. And <laughs> the short answer is no, not really. So with allelopathy, it has been shown. So it's a chemical produ production in plants. It's a defensive mechanism, right? We, we probably have covered this before, but just a quick refresher. Um, some plants do produce some chemicals that inhibit the growth of others. This is uh, to allow them to um, not have the competition um, around them. It's usually live plant material that is going to be producing these chemicals. Um, so by harvesting, um, let's take a walnut tree, for example, um, it's probably famously known for um, suppressing some um, growth around it. It doesn't produce that hormone once it's been harvested and created, um, made into mulch. So that's not just, it's not panned out in the research that we have, that it's not going to be a transfer um, from live plant material to um, plant material then used as, as mulch. So no worries. All right, next question. Will mulch from diseased trees infect plantings? Um, again, not usually. The size part, like the size of mulch being transferred, the, um, you know, the fact that it is a um, dead or, or soon to be dried up remnant of a, a once living plant material, most um, pathogens and pests are feeding on the, um, the harmful ones would be feeding on live plant tissue. And so by harvesting it, you're not going to have that transfer um, into um, your, your planting bed. It also is not probably hypothetically, let's say it's there in the soil right? or it's in there in the mulch and it, it could transfer. There are some that could potentially transfer if it's not in direct contact with the plant itself. Um, like, a, a, like a contacting the roots. Like if you're not incorporating your mulch into the soil, which thereby makes it not mulch. Um, you know, if, if you don't have that root to mulch contact or that plant to root contact, there's a, a significantly reduced chance of uh, pathogen transfer. Um, so something I don't really worry about either um, in my landscape. If you have susceptible um, plants or your prized plants that you're really concerned about, then you can do some um, research and investigation and make sure that you're not um, getting mulch that could potentially infect them. But um, that is a leisure activity that I don't partake in. And I think also one of the sessions we sat in on, they talked about the increase in biological activity and how that creates more competition for pathogens. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess that I, I, I didn't really follow some of that science. Uh, I was maybe a little, maybe I needed more coffee at that point in time, but um, definitely they, they saw like a, re a reduction, I guess, in some of the, the phytophthora rots uh, when they incorporated more mulch uh in their in their landscape wood mulch i suppose i would say that and i know for like for compost and i would assume it'd be similar for mulch you know the, those organisms are breaking down the compost and stuff they kind of you know they may attach to the roots and they're taking up the areas they're attached to the areas where the pathogen would so the pathogen doesn't necessarily have somewhere to attach to the plant so i assume it's kind of similar with mulch so you've got those beneficial microbes that are going to be breaking it down and they're kind of competing with the pathogens um, for those attachment sites and, and things like that. So they're they're kind of outcompeted, and, and those pathogens are in less than ideal environment because they're they're going to be on living plant material. Once that stuff is dead, you know, they've got a limited time that they would be able to move. So if if you do were concerned, you know, you know, if you get fresh stuff, let it sit for a little bit before you apply it. 
Yeah. And also when you have um, an organic or a natural mulch decomposing and you've got, you know, those microbes working in there and you've got a, a well-balanced ecosystem at that scale, you know, we talk about having a diversity of um, plants and, you know, usually at the larger scale, this goes down to the microbe level too. Um, a healthier ecosystem is going to be, um, you know, is going to be more resistant to and be able to um, ward off more pests and pathogens and um, have more vitality than um, one that is is suffering or is missing um, some of those critical elements. You have a whole podcast on fungus and stuff that grows in mulch. Your dog vomits and your stink horns and artillery fungus and all that. We stuff. would have to censor some of those images, though, Ken, that, uh, that arise <laughs> from the mulch. They, they don't look... They're a little phallic in shape, so. <laughs> We're a public university, so yeah, we need to be upstanding members of this community. Let's check out this mushroom. <laughs> that, that looks like something else. Um, okay, we, we've already mentioned this. You already mentioned this, Emily, but let's just uh, let's rehash this here just for a second. Nitrogen, does mulch tie up nitrogen in our soil? No, again, no. Nope. Um, yeah, like I said earlier, it it can tie up nitrogen levels at that intersection between the soil level, the soil surface and the mulch, um, just because that's what decomposing does. Like those microbes use nitrogen in that process, um, but not so much that it is something to be concerned about. Um, you know, it does not make the argument against natural mulches weaker. I think it, it makes it stronger because it eventually becomes um, available to plants. And so, nope, not a worry we need to be concerning ourselves with. Don't till it in. Don't till it in. Nope, that's a different story. Again, that's mm. not mulch. So yeah, that's an amendment. Yeah, it is. Yep, and not a very good one. Mm -mm. No. All right, another one we've kind of briefly touched on. Should we or should we not use landscape fabric when we're using mulch, or just landscape fabric in general? Again, no. I feel like I'm saying that a lot. Um, <laughs> no, we shouldn't. <laughs> um, the natural ecosystem that like, kind of knew what they was doing when it all you know, just dropped um, organic matter on top of the soil and let it do its thing. But um, no, again, like that theory is that it'll, um, you know, be another additional man-made layer between, um, you know, weeds that are soil borne and um, plants. So it can help suppress some of that weed um, or serve as like a weed barrier. It doesn't play out because as we know, every year plants put on more seeds. And so those just fall on top. Um, so it's not really suppressing weeds. What um, it can also do is, so they'll often sell it as, as being porous, so water can penetrate, air can penetrate through, which are critical elements for um, root growth and soil health. Um, over time, quickly, um, not a lot of time, those pores fill up, they get clogged up with, um, you know, just soil particles, organic, you know, particles, they, they, they just get plugged up and then they don't. They don't allow for an air exchange or for water to um, penetrate through. And so your soil um, becomes um, anaerobic in a sense, and it really can suppress some um, root growth. Our running joke was at, as landscaping, the fabric lasts long enough or works to the point where the warranty runs out and then we're done. We don't have to worry about it. Yeah. About a year. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I put mulch down whenever I get my hands on it because it's uh, it's a matter of budgeting time and budgeting money. And whenever I can get mulch on the ground, I will. But is there a seasonal like time of year that works best? Spring, summer, fall? What is there any recommendation? Um, there are some guidelines. Um, certainly having some mulch on the landscape um, versus not having mulch on the landscape, you know, whenever you can get your hands on it is is OK. Um, there's some, some things to be aware of. So I think traditionally we think of applying mulch or freshening up our mulch in the spring, um, which is a good time to, um, apply mulch. It does, um, help with weed suppression. That's a lot of times when, um, some of those annual seeds are going to be, um, germinating. And so by applying mulch in the spring, um, Bas the theory is basically that you're intercepting the sunlight and so those seeds are not going to germinate because they don't have access to um, sun exposure and or it creates a physical barrier that they cannot push through and so you would have weed suppression. 
Now, um, one of the benefits that mulch helps provide is uh, temperature moderation within the soil. And so here heading into um, you know, fall coming up and heading into winter, um, it might be beneficial to assess your landscape and the mulch condition, understanding that mulch on a landscape preserves moisture and um, air in your soil or dry soil is going to have a more rapid change of temperature than um, moist soil, soil that's going to have a lot of moisture in it. And so by reapplying mulch, you can keep more moisture in your soil throughout the winter. And we know in the Midwest, um, these winter months can be really, really dry and desiccating to plant material, which can cause uh, winter burn or dieback. So um, given this year that we've had with this really, you know, dry soils with, um, you know, almost everybody being in drought conditions or near drought conditions, um, I will be assessing the mulch situation in my landscape and reapplying um, to newly planted plants, like newly planted woody um, plant materials or perennial beds. I want to make sure that the, um, I will also be watering those. And I think in a couple of weeks, we'll be talking about water in the landscape. Um, but I want to make sure that those soils and those root systems stay hydrated. Um, it also helps with frost heave. So um, having some mulch on there and avoiding big temperature swings can help keep your plants actually rooted in the ground. I will probably not be reapplying mulch to um, my well-established woody plants because one of the cons or one of the um, risks to having like reapplied mulch right now is that it does keep soil temperatures warmer longer, which can um, be detrimental when plants are trying to acclimate to the upcoming winter months. And so um, that's, you know, those are the kind of the, the pros and cons or the, the cost benefit analysis that you need to do when you're looking at how, um, where and when to apply mulch to the landscape. Um, yeah, I, I, it's hard to, I think mulch, like I said, I think mulch is good on the landscape. You go around your plants. Almost always, there's just a, the slight risk of delay of acclimation for winter. And we don't know what kind of winter we're going to have. If it's a mild winter, it's not going to be as um, risky as if it's, you know, really harsh, um, cold, early winter. And I found in, in like vegetable garden settings, sometimes if you've got a pretty good mulch on your, in your vegetable garden, those soils are a little slower to warm up. So if, if there's something you want to get in early, you may want to clear a spot. Um, at some point in the spring, let that soil warm up a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to be digging into frozen ground later yeah. than you would normally be. But I, I think, I think it, the, the benefits far away that, that slight delay. Yeah. You also have to consider the soil type. Um, so if you have like a compacted soil or um, a soil that is more um, clay-like in consistency that can retain moisture on its own. And so by adding mulch to the top of it, um, whether it's like for um, winter and like the wet spring, like early, like warming up and drying out, or just in, you know, the summer months, like if you are conserving moisture in a soil that already conserves moisture, it can be problematic um, for root systems and create that anaerobic um, soil conditions and lead to root rot and other other challenges and so um, you know pay attention to the kind of soil that you have um, when you're making decisions regarding mulch. To that end I will say that over time natural mulches on a clay soil or a compacted soil that decomposition that we were talking about earlier can help improve the soil structure so um, it just would affect how much soil or excuse me how much mulch you would apply um, to the surface. Um, I would still advocate for having a, a natural material wood mulch on top of clay soil, just when and how much you apply would be um, the variabilities. And I think the particle size would play a, a big part in that too. I think your your bigger stuff, you can get away with more if it's like sawdust, then you're, then you're asking for trouble on, yeah. on heavier soils. Yep. Yeah, I find the sawdust on a heavy soil just white, just runs off <laughs> it can't get a hold of anything it's just heavy rain just washes it off like it's on a yep. piece of glass or something yeah those like singular or um evenly sized particles and those smaller part size particles just like lock together you know it's how clay works in the soil that's if you you know kind of step back and look at 
Now, this is a whole nother fun podcast is talking about soils. But um, if you look at like particle size and shape, you know, clay um, soil particles like lock together. That's why they repel water. And that's why they're hard to um, have root growth um, penetrate through because they're just they're small and they they tie up. So if we had a, a kind of a summation of everything, lay it on thick, keep it chunky. Um, <laughs> that's how I like. We my need ice shirts cream. that say that. Just like yes. peanut butter. Yes, that's like right. Peanut butter. <laughs> lay it on <laughs> thick and keep it chunky. Oh yeah, I like that. Well, that was a lot of great information about mulch. That wasn't so bad. I feel okay now. I'm, I, that wasn't as bad as I thought. I I still feel like I'm a I'm a professional horticulturist now. So very good. Very good. Well, uh, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension, edited this week by Ken Johnson. Thank you, Ken, for that nice little audible helping me out this week uh, in editing two times in a row. So thank you, Ken. Uh, and a special thank you to Emily Zweihart for joining us and answering all of our mulch questions. Um, and, and making me feel better about my spot in my career and where I'm at in life. So thank you, Emily. Oh, you're welcome. You're doing great, Chris. You're doing great, Ken. Very happy to be with you guys. Thank you for being on, Chris. No problem. Happy to do it. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. We are going to be talking with state climatologist Trent Ford about what's up with the weather this year and what to expect this fall and early winter. The Climate Prediction Center has their uh, numbers out and uh, he is gonna share those with us. So it's gonna be a fun show. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best and that is listening or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching and as always, keep on growing. Are you taking bets on something?